Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Jacob and this is the fourth video in my blockchain in Rust series. This is the video we're going to be going over the concepts of transactions and in the video after this we'll be going over uh, actual implementation of everything I talk about in this video. So this is transactions one. Uh, transactions two is where we're going to be actually coding everything. So uh, skip to that one if you want to just get to the coding, but if you want to understand everything that's going on, uh, please stick around. All right, so here's my little intro slide. You can find the code uh, at this bottom link here. It's on GitHub, and yeah, let's jump in. Okay, so let's get to the actual cryptocurrency part of this project. Uh, transactions, right? We wanna send money from one person to another person. So here's my little example. We have, you know, Alice has 50 coins, Bob has seven coins, and Alice sends Bob 12 coins. So we subtract 12 from Alice's balance and add 12 to Bob's balance, right? If only it were that simple. This is, I mean, that example is kind of like treating the blockchain like a spreadsheet. You know, you have an entry for Alice and Alice's entry says 50 next to it and Bob's entry says seven next to it. And so you just say, oh, look, Alice wants to send 12 coins to Bob. I'm going to subtract 12 from 50, okay? So Alice has 38 coins, and I'm gonna add 12 to Bob. So Bob has 19 coins, right? That would be, well, very simple, very nice to implement, easy to implement. But unfortunately, it's not entirely secure. So there's a couple things we have to address, questions we have to answer for every transaction to ensure that the integrity of the network, just to, to ensure the integrity of the network. Um, there's a lot more than just the three I'm gonna talk about in this video, and you can go check out that link there. Uh, it'll be in the description too if you want to read more about the uh, different rules for verifying transactions, but we're just gonna go over these uh, three right now. Um, the first is overspending. It asks the question, where did the money come from? So, for example, Alice sends a transaction and it says, subtract five coins from Alice's balance, but, sent, but add 12 coins to Bob's balance. That's dishonest because you're generating these extra seven coins out of nowhere, right? So that would be an example of overspending. Uh, then we have this double spending problem. Is the money available is kind of the question we're asking here. So imagine if Alice sends a transaction, or Alice makes two transactions. So one of them is Alice sending 50 coins to, uh, to Chris, and one of them is sending 50 coins to Bob. And she sends them both at the same time, but she sends one to Chris and, and the other to Bob, right? So they update their spreadsheets and then their accountants talk to each other and say, hey, wait a minute, our, our ledgers don't match up and they have to somehow resolve that situation. Um, but meanwhile, maybe, uh, maybe Bob or Chris had been doing some uh, business with Alice and now Alice gets away with the, with whatever, maybe like physical assets she had traded the digital currency for, uh, but she just sent the same money to two different people. And before their accountants could talk to each other, well, now Alice got away. So that's an example of the double spending problem where you try and spend the same, the same money twice. Uh, so we have to fix that. And then the third one we're going to talk about in this video is the impersonation problem, like identity theft kind of. It's like, okay, so Alice generates a transaction that says that Chris sent Alice the entire contents of Chris's wallet. And Alice tells this to Bob. And I mean, maybe Bob doesn't have a way to contact Chris directly. So all Bob knows to do is trust Alice and say, okay, I guess, I guess Chris really did send Alice the entire contents of his wallet. And then Bob updates his ledger. And now as far as the network is concerned, Chris is out his money. <laughs> so we have to fix that problem too. So 
Before we get into that, let's talk about the blockchain as a distributed ledger. Distributed meaning everyone has a copy. So Chris has a copy, Bob has a copy, Alice has a copy, and ledger meaning it's like the history of transactions that have occurred in our cryptocurrency network. Yay, it's getting even closer to looking like a cryptocurrency, this project. Um, so uh, the, the transaction that we were talking about earlier on an earlier slide is uh, here highlighted in green on block 125. And if you look at this, one of the questions you might ask is, okay, so Alice is sending Bob 12 coins. Where did Alice get those 12 coins? And you can look back at block 124. Nope, nothing there. Block 123. Oh, Chris sent Alice 50 coins. And then, of course, you could ask the same question again. Where did Chris get those 50 coins? And you can go back and back and back, and you can track where every single coin came from. Uh, of course, eventually you'll get to the point where the coins were generated, uh, but we'll ignore that for now. We'll get to it later in this video. Don't worry. But for now, just assume there is a history of transactions that we can rely upon. Okay, and now we're going to look at the structure of a transaction. So there's really two components we care about inputs and outputs. Oh, and by the way, inputs are outputs. If that's really confusing, let me just explain it really quick. So we're assuming we have this history of transactions that we can kind of look back on. Um, and an input is just like Alice saying, look, back in block 123, Chris sent me 50 coins. I want to use those 50 coins now and send 12 of them to Bob. Okay, so Alice saying, look, back in block 123, I received these 50 coins. That's like the input. It's, it's a reference. It's like pointing at a specific transaction and saying, look, I received these coins over here. I want to use those now. And an output is Alice saying, okay, now I'm going to take 12 of those and send them to Bob. And actually for this transaction uh, that we've been talking about in this video, there would be uh, probably two outputs. Uh, you'd have the single input of 50 coins, but then two outputs where 12 coins go to Bob and then the remaining 38 go back uh, and s get sent to 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 Alice again because as soon as you use a single output as an input it's considered spent and so you can't use it again you'd have to make a new output to spend the remainder of those coins later so I just hope this this makes sense to you right we have two two components to our transactions a list of inputs which are just older outputs and then a list of new outputs that we can use in, in later transactions so this is kind of what I was talking about just um, a little more uh, laid out uh, concrete. We have a set of inputs, which are unused outputs from previous transactions, and a set of outputs, which are new outputs that can be used in future transactions later. And then we can actually calculate two things. Just from just from these two sets, we can, we can calculate two things about the nature of this transaction, this one particular transaction we're talking about. One is the value of the transaction. Obviously, it's 50 coins in our little example. Uh, you just sum the value of all the inputs. We only have one input. It's a value of 50. So it's a 50 coin transaction. And then the value of the fee. And this is something we haven't talked about yet, uh, the fee, the minor fee. So whenever you send a transaction, you want to include a little something for whoever's going to mine the block to incentivize them to include your transaction in the next block, right? Because it takes work for the miner to mine a block. So they don't just want to do it for free, right? There will be a block reward later, but they also would like to, they have no incentive to include your transaction above any of the others. So you want to include a little fee for them to just, you know, encourage them, encourage that miner to include your transaction in the block that they mine. And you include a fee by not spending all of the coins uh, that are uh, brought into the transaction from all the inputs you, you included. So for example, in our little example where we have 50 coins coming in, Maybe in order to encourage the miner to mine the block 
uh, that includes her transaction faster, Alice might instead say, okay, I'm going to send 12 of those 50 to Bob. And instead of sending the remaining 38 to me, I'm going to only send 36 back to me and leave two that are unspent. And then the miner, whoever ends up mining this block will say, oh, look, they didn't spend all of their inputs. I'll just, you know, take the remainder for myself which is exactly what that uh, remaining value is for. It's the minor fee. So you just subtract the value of the outputs from the value of the inputs to discover the value of the fee. And now let's talk about Coinbase transactions. So I said we could go back and back and back and back and back, and we were relying on this history of transactions always existing. But obviously, the blockchain has to start somewhere. This history of transactions has to start somewhere. And for any given coin, any given set of transactions, it's they all start at a Coinbase or multiple Coinbase transactions. You only get one per block. And when the miner mines a block, they get to add once one special Coinbase transaction that has no inputs and still produces an output. So it's like we're generating money out of thin air, except remember, it's kind of like we're paying the miner for their service because they have just secured, they have verified all of these transactions for us. And now, I mean, they kind of expect a little something, right? So and that's um, where these Coinbase transactions come in. They allow the miner to actually, actually do two things. They can collect uh, the block reward that's agreed upon by the network, like for example, in Bitcoin's case, the block reward, every time you mine a block, you get 12 and a half Bitcoins. That's just fixed. That's set, right? But you also get all the transaction fees and those all trickle down and then you collect them all, scoop all, all the transaction fees and the block reward, add them all together and make that one Coinbase transaction. And that's, you know, you only get one of those per block that doesn't require an input. So that's a really exceptional case. Uh, but that's how a Coinbase transaction uh, looks and works on a blockchain. So here is my terrible illustration to hopefully help you visualize a little bit of what's going on here. We have uh, this blue ellipse oval thingy um, that represents a Coinbase transaction. The arrows represent inputs and outputs. Uh, so it's like we have uh, an input slash output going from it was it was generated at the Coinbase transaction, then it goes to a transaction, uh, and that generates two outputs, and one goes to one transaction, one goes to another, and you can see it continues on, and it allows for a lot of complexity, but it's still a relatively simple to understand system. Okay, so here's a little recap of how transactions are going to work in our little blockchain project. So, a transaction has a set of in has a set of inputs. And those are just old outputs that haven't been spent before. And it will generate a new set of outputs that can be spent later. So here's a little example. We have 50 coins that go in and you generate two outputs, 12 and 36, right? And the two left over just go to the miner as their fee. And so how does this, uh, how, how does this like strategy for transactions, if you could call it that, maybe it's a methodology of transaction, methodology of transacting, how does this solve these transaction verification requirements? So the first one was overspending, where Alice says, okay, I'm only going to subtract five from my ledger, but, you know, add 12 to someone else's or something like that. Basically, I mean, the easy, this is, this is pretty easy to verify. You just make sure that the sum of all the inputs coming in is always greater than or equal to the sum of all the outputs going out. And that way you can't generate coins out of thin air, right? Pretty simple solution. Okay, so double spending. This is a little, um, this is a simplified description of the actual solution, which we won't really be getting into because it's, rather complex. There will be links in the description where you can uh, read and find out more. But the basic idea for double spending to prevent double spending is you only have one person who's going to mine the block, right? They'll mine the block, um, but they have checked every transaction in there and they can just 
you know, keep a collection of all of the outputs that haven't been spent yet. And as soon as they get a transaction that's going to spend that output, they say, okay, that's going to be a spent output. And nobody else can use that output as an input because now it's been spent. So if Alice were, were to send, uh, you know, the 50 to Chris and the 50 to Bob, when the miner receives one of those transactions, they'll say, okay, this one looks fine. But then when they receive the second one, they'll be like, hey, you already tried, you, you already spent that output. You can't use this one and they'll throw it out. And it's really just kind of up to the miner which one gets through. Um, but I mean, Alice kind of had it coming. She was trying to cheat the system. So that's how uh, we, with this methodology of transacting, are going to uh, simply prevent double spending. And then finally, the last one, we're actually not going to implement this in the code in the next video, but we might get to it when we talk about smart contracts. Um, bas basically, for um, I'll give a little, uh, little description of asymmetric cryptography. So there's a mathematical way that you can, it's called signing, uh, that you can mathematically verify that you were the person who generated this transaction and then um, the miner doesn't have to talk to you after that. They can just uh, mathematically verify that you were the person who sent this transaction and they can say, okay, so this person sent this transaction and they have verified that they own these coins. All right, great. I'll add it to the block. And if they mine it, then it gets added to the blockchain. But the important part is that they can mathematically verify your identity. They can mathematically verify that you were the person who sent these coins and it wasn't Alice trying to steal your coins, trying to spend your coins for you. Um, and yeah, we might get to this when we talk about smart contracts or a little bit later. I don't know. It depends on how much interest there is remaining in this project when we get to that point. But uh, that will conclude this video. This is, Remember, this is just the conceptual portion of uh, the transactions part of this series. The next video is where we're going to be implementing uh, at least the first two, uh, well, we'll be implementing transactions and then hopefully the first two little uh, questions that we'll be asking uh, in the next video or uh, in a couple after that. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. And uh, my name is Jacob. Have a good one.